the uh, absolute pleasure of having our own Dr. Ruth O'Regan give our medical grand rounds. Dr. O'Regan obtained her medical degrees from University College in Dublin, Ireland, and then took a, I would say, a hybrid transatlantic approach to her medicine training uh, in internal medicine and HEMONC, uh, training in both Dublin and the states, including time at Medical College of Wisconsin and Northwestern. Um, after completing her fellowship at Northwestern, she stayed on there for several years as faculty, then moved to Emory, where she rose to the rank of professor in hematology and medical oncology before being recruited to University of Wisconsin in 2015 to become the chief of hematology, medical oncology, and palliative care. Her UW leadership roles quickly expanded and included such things as the director of cancer therapy, discovery, and development program, and Deputy Director of the UW Carbone Cancer Center. Dr. O'Regan's research and clinical interests have revolved around the biology of breast cancer, and the breadth of her work is truly impressive. Over the years, her work in understanding breast cancer has spanned the full spectrum of research, ranging from cell culture experiments to mouse models of cancer to novel imaging modalities, clinical trials, and population-based studies. Um, and one area of particular interest to Dr. O'Regan is the development of novel therapeutic approaches to treat resistant breast cancers. And I'd say, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that her work has influenced the way we manage breast cancer patients today. And as a reflection of that, she's even co-authored the clinical practice guidelines for breast cancer through her role with the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Her work has resulted in over almost 100 referee journal articles, 14 book chapters, and over 200 invited presentations around the world. Her renown has led to multiple national leadership positions, including the chief scientific officer of the Big Ten Cancer Research Consortium and the vice chair of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Board of Directors. She's editor in chief for Clinical Breast Cancer Journal and the breast cancer section editor for the journal Cancer. And then finally, as a division chief, she's excelled in the mentorship of her faculty and has propelled her trainees and faculty to success and the national spotlight. And as I'm sure you all know, Ruth is leaving us uh, at the end of next month to become the chair of medicine at University of Rochester. And I have no doubt she will continue to be successful and more importantly, we'll make sure that her department and her faculty are extremely successful. I will speak for all of us to, know, to say that she's gonna be missed by everyone and we all wish her the best in her new adventures. And it's especially meaningful for us today to have her give a grand rounds about her work in triple negative breast cancer. So thank you, Ruth. And we hope to have you come back again as a guest and maybe go to a uh, Packers game or Badgers game um, <laughs> once we're back in person. So <laughs> thanks. Or, or I'll take a visit in the summer either. So. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn, for that very nice introduction. And I'm going to apologize from the get-go. I apologize for two breast cancer lectures in the space for a few weeks. It really wasn't our intention. It just happened that way. So this one will definitely be different from the last one from Dr. Hirschman's, however. Um, so here's my disclosures. And um, the title of the talk I'm going to give today is Triple Negative Breast Cancer, the Elusive Search for Targets. But what I really want to kind of um, talk about is some of the successes we've had in other types of breast cancer as well as kind of a background to where we'd like to really go with triple negative breast cancer. So first of all, a few facts. I think as everybody here probably knows, breast cancer is very common in the United States it's uh, estimated that between uh, one in seven to one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. And the current figures are that there's about 270,000 uh, patients diagnosed with breast cancer annually in the United States. And unfortunately, we're still losing 40,000 patients to, met to uh, metastatic disease on an annual basis. Overall, the good news is the outcomes have improved um, through a number of factors, including greater awareness, as we'll talk about uh, during this talk, the breast cancer adv advocacy uh, networks have been really very impressive in basically getting patients to go in for, or getting women to go in for screening. 
early detection through screening. And, and what I'm going to really focus on today is more effective therapies, which have really revolutionized the treatment of certain subsets of breast cancer. So um, we also know that, and a lot of this talk is going to focus on metastatic breast cancer. Um, we know that uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer are living longer, but the problem is that metastatic disease remains incurable at this time point. So I'm putting in this case, and we'll talk about this uh, later on in the uh, in, in the talk. So Mary's a 72 year old female with a diagnosis of metastatic triple negative breast cancer. She was initially diagnosed in May of 2011, at which time she underwent a right mastectomy with a central lymph node biopsy and had a pretty early stage triple negative breast cancer. You can see it was a stage one, T1B and zero. Um, she, however, took an aggressive course and, and did adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, however, four years later, she came in with basically a lump on her neck, was found to have adenopathy and had a biopsy that revealed recurrent triple negative breast cancer. Um, as, be, as becoming standard, um, she had some genetic analysis done, which we can talk about, which didn't show any mutations. And, and we'll talk about this later, but it, it is pretty routine, um, at least for, from the NCCN guidelines for women under the age of 60 diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer to have genetic testing. But we typically do it in most patients with metastatic disease as well now, which we'll, we'll talk about later as well. Um, so when we talk about metastatic breast cancer, the kind of goals of treatment are obviously we want to prolong survival, but we want that to be meaningful survival. And what I mean by that is we don't want patients on incredibly toxic drugs where their quality of life is majorly impacted by the treatment that we're, we're giving them. We also, of course, want to treat symptomatic disease, which will improve quality of life. Um, and in certain subsets of breast cancer, particularly uh, metastatic breast cancer that expresses estrogen receptor, one of our goals is to prolong the use of chemotherapy by using less toxic targeted agents. And I would say that overall, our goal with metastatic breast cancer is to turn it into a chronic disease like diabetes, for example. And I would say that we're not at that point, but I think we are getting closer to that point, certainly in some patients. So really, when we talk about all of uh, uh, cancer treatment right now, it's all about targeted treatment and really working out what it is, it is that's driving an individual cancer and driving that protein or, or, or gene. So the real idea behind this is trying to deliver the most effective therapy to the cancer, but decreasing the toxicity from off-targeted effects. And I would say right now in breast cancer, looking at this bullseye, we're probably in the good, maybe very good range. So we still have a long way to go um, in terms of, 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 of treating uh, breast cancer. It's really with this kind of precision approach. Um, so what I'm gonna to cover today is firstly a history of targeted agents in breast cancer. And it's gonna be focused on hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive breast cancer. Then we'll talk very briefly about some of the new targeted agents, really as a way of just showing you how we really prolong survival for patients with metastatic breast cancer. And then um, the last part of the talk, I will talk about metastatic triple negative breast cancer, uh, particularly the systemic management and some of the clinical trials that we're doing here at UW. Um, so the first one thing I wanted to talk about was the whole uh, association of um, estrogen and estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So I actually gave grand rounds, I think the first year I came here was about maybe five years or six years ago. Um, and I, I certainly showed this slide at that time point. So I apologize if some people have heard this before, but um, this story actually goes back to the late 1800s. And um, what happened was there was a surgeon in Scotland called Mr. Beetson. And he was talking to some farmers in the Scottish Highlands. And they said to him that when they took the ovaries from their cows, um, it altered the cow's capacity to lactate and also changed the quality of their udders. So he's very interested with this and it kind of suggested there was some link between the ovaries and the breasts. So he um, had three premenopausal patients in, in his clinic that had breast cancer and he went ahead and started to remove their ovaries. And amazingly to him, and I think to anybody at the time, what he found was that the breast tumor shrank dramatically. Subsequent to this, he went down to London and told some surgeons in London about his, uh, his findings with these women. And uh, they went out and did, and did the same to a number of other women. And what they noted was that it worked in some of the women, but not in all of the women. So in about two thirds of the women, the breast cancer responded to the oophorectomy, but one third it did not. And this kind of puzzled him. And um, he referred to it as a hidden misquality of the benefit um, and became known as Beetson's riddle because at the time, of course, nobody knew about estrogen or, or certainly not the estrogen receptor. 
So the next part of the puzzle um, really happened here in the Midwest, and that was the discovery of the estrogen receptor. So in 1958, it was discovered that estrogen localized the female reproductive tract, including the breast. And then uh, Elwood Jensen at, in, at University of Chicago identified the estrogen receptor in 1967 and then cloned it in 1986. So now we had kind of this association of the ovaries with the breasts. This estrogen receptor had been discovered, but there was still no link between the estrogen receptor and breast cancers per se. And around the same time, back in the United Kingdom, the drug tamoxifen was being developed. Now, tamoxifen, interestingly enough, was initially developed as a contraceptive. Um, but what they found was in animal studies, when they gave tamoxifen to rats, it actually induced fertility. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. If you have any younger patients on tamoxifen, it actually is a fertility agent um, and it, it, it can actually cause damage to unborn uh, children. So it's important when patients are taking tamoxifen that they do use adequate contraception. But for whatever reason, they decided to look at tamoxifen in patients with breast cancer because at that time, they were actually using estrogen to treat uh, breast cancer, which I know sounds crazy, but we actually still do that today. Um, because uh, tamoxifen appeared to have kind of had this endocrine effect, they went ahead and did this pretty small trial in patients with uh, metastatic breast cancer. And what they found was when they treated 46 patients, they found 10 who had a good response. So again, this is the same thing that Mr. Beaton had found is that this kind of endocrine approach to these cancers was effective in some patients, but not in other patients. And again, there was no really understanding of why this was. But actually coming back to now University of Wisconsin, the puzzle was eventually solved by Craig Jordan, who was at Wisconsin for a number of years. And what he found in the lab was that if he looked at cancer cells that expressed estrogen receptor, they were the ones that were responsive to tamoxifen, while the cells that lacked the estrogen receptor did not respond. Um, so, so this was really the first kind of, I think this probably was the first kind of targeted therapy in cancer where you actually had a target, which was estrogen receptor, you had a drug tamoxifen, and by using this drug tamoxifen to target the estrogen receptor, you were actually able to inhibit growth of these cancer cells. So this is from the Emperor of All Maladies. Um, it said, for the first time in the history of cancer, a drug, its target, and a cancer cell have been conjoined by a core molecular logic. Now, while Dr. Jordan was here, he did a number of other very important things with regards to tamoxifen. He did all the preclinical work showing that tamoxifen not only treated breast cancer, but also can prevent breast cancer. And this led to a very large trial that confirmed these findings and ultimately to FDA approval. And then the other thing shown at the bottom of this slide is the fact that he was the first person to show in a mouse model that although tamoxifen very effectively inhibits breast cancer, it actually stimulates the growth of endometrial cancer. So what you can see here, if you look at these mice, is this is the breast tumor shown over on the right part of the, on the right part of the slide, where the tumor is completely inhibited. However, you can see a very large tumor, endometrial cancer, on the other side of the mouse. And this just shows it here, basically showing these cancers essentially growing with tamoxifen, as you can see uh, shown over here. Um, so th this, of course, was a very important finding, which of course was subsequently seen in the clinic. I, I always say when I talk about this, however, that this is a pretty minor, I wouldn't say minor, but it's, it's it, the benefit risk for patients taking tamoxifen is very much in favor of treating the breast cancer because typically the uterine cancers that occur with tamoxifen tend to be very early stage cancers. They're usually pretty easy to treat and, and uh, usually patients present with, with um, vaginal bleeding. Um, so the, the use of endocrine therapy has been incredibly important in treating estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Um, and this is back from um, a series that was done in 2004, um, basically showing, if you look at the left-hand part of the slide, that um, by using endocrine agents, um, you are, the survival for patients with estrogen receptor positive metastatic breast cancer is in the range of about four years or so. And this is back in 2004. And what we're looking at here is um, in the black line is when we kind of just had tamoxifen. In the purple line is when we had other drugs like aromatase inhibitors, for example. But you can see that the median survival for these patients is between three to four years. So they are living a reasonably long time with their metastatic disease. What we'll talk about later on, however, is the estrogen receptor um, uh, metastatic cancer shown over here, where 
during these two time periods, um, even though there were new drugs approved, there was no improved outcome. And you can see the median survival for these patients is only about a year or so. So it's, it's, they do considerably, or a considerably worse outcome than the estrogen receptor positive cancers. Now, the other very important story in breast cancer is the story of the HER2 receptor. So the HER2 is a, um, a transmembrane receptor that's overexpressed in about one third of breast cancers. It was discovered back in about the 1980s by Dennis Slayman at UCLA. And what he found was that these cancers that overexpress this HER2 protein had a very aggressive natural history and it had a, a, lightly, uh, a very high propensity to develop metastatic disease at very short time following diagnosis. Um, importantly, they're also associated with the development of brain metastasis, which actually has become a really pretty significant issue with these cancers because as I'll show you, the treatment that we have for these cancers is, is really so successful. So although these cancers are very aggressive, what happened right after the receptor was found was that this drug, Trentuzumab, was developed by Dr. Slayman and Genentech. And this is a humanized anti-HER2 antibody that has very high affinity and specificity for the protein. It's mainly a human antibody, so it has a very low risk of um, immunologic toxicity. And um, what was found in, uh, in his preclinical studies was that if you took a HER2 positive breast cancer and treat it with, with transtuzumab, it's also known as Herceptin, you actually, to some degree, inhibit a growth of these cancers. But if you added in a chemotherapy drug, there was a very dramatic reduction in the growth of these tumors. So he basically led a registration trial for transtuzumab, which is shown here. Now, what's very important about this study is that at the time that this drug came out, um, when we did trials in patients with breast cancer, we basically treated every patient with breast cancer with a drug. We never really thought about what the drug was targeting. But Dr. Slayman knew from his work that this drug would only work in cancers that overexpressed HER2. So he had to basically fight with the FDA to allow the trial to be just done in patients whose cancers overexpressed the HER2 protein. So he eventually won out on this. And, and this was also the, the breast cancer advocacy uh, groups were formed around this time, and they were very influential in kind of, you know, uh, forcing the FDA's hand to really only look at this drug and HER2-positive breast cancers. So what this study was, essentially, they took patients with cancers that were metastatic, had not had prior treatment, and um, um, had overexpression of the HER2 protein. And they were randomized to receive either, either chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy with transtuzumab. And what they found was the patients who received transtuzumab had a much uh, a, a significantly longer control of their, their, their breast cancer. But they also found, as shown here, is that there was a five-month improvement in survival. Now, you may say, well, five months improvement in survival doesn't sound that great. But the important thing to keep in mind with the study is that the patients on the control arm, actually a very significant number of them went on to get transtuzumab a disease progression. So that somehow belonged to the survival benefit here. So you'll have to trust me that this was a very significant improvement in survival. Now, the other interesting thing about this study for the cardiologists in the audience is that this was the first time we discovered that transtuzumab could, could cause um, cardiomyopathy. Um, and the cardiomyopathy that, that transtuzumab is associated with really only occurs in patients who are either receiving anthracytines or who have previously received anthracytines. All the patients in this trial either got anthracytine as part of the chemotherapy regimen on this trial or had received a prior anthracytine. Um, so what we do with regard to that, we've moved kind of away from giving anthracytines to these patients, but we do monitor their, their um, cardiac function every three months while they're on transtuzumab, at least in the early stage setting. So one of the questions here is, well, this is great. So this, this is a subset of breast cancers that are benefiting from this transtuzumab drug. But what, would have, what about patients that have cancers that don't have high levels of HER2, the HER2 protein? And was Dr. Slayman correct? Well, he actually was, because this is a study that was done a few years later <clears throat> that looked at patients who had HER2 normal or HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. And they were again randomized to receive chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy plus transtuzumab. And what you can see here is that there is no benefit for transtuzumab in these patients. And the reason this is very important is because it really shows that 
precision oncology is important and we really need to be very important or, or very vigilant about if we know that a drug targets a specific protein, we need to make sure that we only enroll patients whose tumor actually express that protein or, or for example, a gene. And because otherwise, essentially the drug is going to fail. And if we had done this trial first, we wouldn't have transtuzumab. And transtuzumab really revolutionized the, uh, patient, uh, the treatment of patients with all stages of HER2 positive breast cancer. And this just shows for metastatic disease what the use of transtuzumab accomplished. And this is a, kind of an old study now. But what we're looking at is the outcome of patients with metastatic breast cancer that's either HER2 positive or HER2 negative. And if it is HER2 positive, whether they got transtuzumab or not. And you can see here in the patients with HER2 positive breast cancer who did not get transtuzumab, they have a fairly poor outcome, as you can see. Um, however, if you give transtuzumab in the yellow shown here, you can see these patients do just as well as the patients with HER2 negative breast cancers, and in fact, do better over the first uh, two years, as you can see shown here. Um, so, so really, this is, was a huge advance. We now use this drug. Uh, along with other HER2-directed agents in the early stage setting. And we're actually curing, you know, a very large number of these patients with HER2-positive breast cancer. And just, I, I always show this slide because I, I guess if you're going to be a very important scientist, you really have to have a, a lifetime movie made about you. Um, this was a, a movie that was made uh, about the, the whole Herceptin story, Transtuzumab story, and, and Dr. Slayman. Um, and Dr. Slayman, um, Probably most of you don't know him, but he was played by Harry Connick Jr. in in this uh, in this uh, in this particular movie. And um, so it's actually worth watching just because it really points to the the power of the breast uh, advocacy movement in this whole story. Um, I will say there is a there's a scene in the movie where Dennis Slayman is in the shower crying because the FDA won't let him do the trial just in her two positive disease. And for any of us who know, know Dennis Slayman, that really couldn't possibly have happened. But if you ever want to, it's a it's a kind of a corny movie, but uh, it's it's actually quite interesting just with regard to you know the development of this really life saving drug. Um, so so this is kind of where we were in the nineteen ninety in the nineteen at the end of nineteen ninety. So we had a bunch of endocrine therapies that that targeted the estrogen receptor, transtuzumab that targeted the HER two uh, receptor, and then we kind of went into the genomic era. And the genomic era has been very important because it really has uh, led to the discovery of a lot of other agents for treating breast cancer. But the first thing it told us that was kind of like something that we knew already was that breast cancers are not all alike. So we've known that anyway, because we knew some of them were estrogen receptor positive, some of them were HER2 positive, some of them expressed both estrogen receptor and HER2. But this data really kind of brought this home. So this is a set of genes called the intrinsic subset. And what they found was that if they looked at a bunch of early stage breast cancers um, and looked at these 50 genes, they clustered into these different subtypes of breast cancer. Two luminal subtypes that are both estrogen receptor positive and ERB2 subtype, which is essentially HER2 positive. And then the basal subtype, which is kind of um, what we think of as triple negative breast cancer, which we'll talk about in a few slides. And what we what you can see here is that each of these subtypes has a different recurrence rate shown here. So this is time to distant uh, recurrence and also overall survival shown here. And just if you look at the biology of, the, of these cancers, you can see the HER2 positive cancer shown in purple. This is before we had transtuzumab, had really a very high recurrence rate, very poor survival. We'll talk about the triple negative cancers a little bit later, but you can see that they again have a very high recurrence rate, poor survival. But the interesting thing about these cancers is that um, if you make it to five years with triple negative breast cancer, your risk of recurrence is actually very low. But the most striking data from this, which we're not going to talk about today, is that there's two very radically different estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. The luminal A subtype that have a pretty low recurrence rate and a pretty favorable survival, but luminal B cancers here that have a very high recurrence rate and a survival that actually approximates the HER2 positive from basal um, uh, uh, survives, as you can see shown here. And this is a huge problem, which is a, a, a story for another day, but it does appear that part of the reason for this is that these luminal B cancers appear to be resistant to endocrine agents like tamoxifen. Um, so, so this is important, and we do use uh, some of these genomic so, um, typing in clinical practice to determine what kind of breast cancer our patients have. And actually, in terms of making therapeutic decisions specifically about whether a patient with early stage breast cancer needs chemotherapy or not. 
Um, so as I mentioned, this genomic era has led to a whole bunch of new drugs being approved. This is specifically for ER positive metastatic breast cancer. And you can see that um, up to 2000 or so, we just had endocrine agents. Um, in the past decade, as you can see, we've had a whole bunch of other targeted agents approved that target various pathways like the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway, um, but also these CDK inhibitors, which have really um, markedly improved outcome for patients with ER-positive metastatic breast cancer. And here's an example of one of these trials with the CDK inhibitors. Um, this is with a, a drug called ribocyclob. And what was done here was these are patients with ER-positive metastatic breast cancer who haven't received prior treatment, and they're randomized to standard treatment with an endocrine agent alone or with the CDK inhibitor. And what we found across all of these trials is that adding in the CDK inhibitor, which have pretty low toxicity actually, pretty much doubles the progression-free survival of disease, disease controls you can see shown here, and really have meaningful impacts on overall survival as, as well shown over here. So you can see the curve split in favor of the, the CDK inhibitor. And in this particular study, what you can see on the control arm is that the patients um, are living maybe uh, approximately four years or so on the control arm. It hasn't been reached in the ribocyclob arm, suggesting that the median overall survival for these patients is probably going to be in five years or more. So you can see that even from what I showed you earlier, um, a decade later, we're actually improving these patients' survival by, by a year at least, as you can see shown here. And this is a bell-shaped curve, so there are patients that are living even longer than that. And I just want to mention Mark Burkhardt in our group is actually doing a study um, we're basically focused on these patients that are living for, you know, years and years and years, sometimes decades with metastatic breast cancer, trying to achieve this goal of turning this disease into a chronic disease. And then with the HER2 positive breast cancers, um, this is, is, isn't even up to date. There is so many agents available right now that target the HER2, uh, HER2, uh, that target the HER2 protein. Um, there's other antibodies such as pertuzumab, which I'll show you in a second, also tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, antibody drug conjugates. And in fact, I have to say in, in this year alone, there has been three additional agents approved for metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer, um, which is really quite remarkable. And they uh, several of them actually importantly have um, very efficacious, appear effective for patients with brain metastasis as well, because as I mentioned earlier, this is a big problem for HER2 positive uh, breast cancer because the drugs we have are so good that they actually control the systemic disease. Um, so patients are, are basically recurring in their brain and actually not having any systemic disease. So it kind of acts as a sanctuary site. But just to illustrate to you how successful these treatments have been, um, this is a study that looked at adding in a second HER2 antibody, pertuzumab, which is somewhat similar to trastuzumab in with chemotherapy in patients with untreated metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. And uh, by adding in this really non-toxic antibody, the survival for these patients was prolonged by about 16 months, as you can see shown here. But I think what's most striking about this data is that if you look here, this is the median survival in the patients that received the pertuzumab. And you can see that it's approximating six years, which like is just uh, unbelievable. And again, as I mentioned, there are patients that live even longer than that. And with these um, new agents that we had approved this year, we're very hopeful that we can actually prolong the survival even further. So, so I think for HER2 positive and ER positive breast cancer, we are getting to a point where I think this metastatic disease is becoming more chronic. Um, you know, it's, I don't think it's quite like diabetes yet, but but I think at this point, with all these agents that are coming down the pipeline, um, we are we are getting closer to achieving our goal. So now, just to move to a more depressing uh, part of the whole picture, and this is really triple negative breast cancers. So I mentioned earlier, and I just want to reiterate this um, that. For every breast cancer, if they're picked up early enough, they're curable. And this is certainly true for triple negative breast cancer. But again, it has this very striking recurrence rate over the first two years or so, as you can see, um, where you can see more, way more than, than half of the patients are actually uh, developing a distant recurrence. And you can see their survival is really very poor, as you can see shown here. Now, I should have said this earlier, but just the, the definition of triple negative breast cancer is, of course, it's the cancer that lacks the, the proteins that we've been talking about for the, the first part of the talk. So it lacks estrogen receptor, it lacks HER2 nu, and it also, why is it triple? It's triple because progesterone receptor, which is a downstream 
gene of estrogen receptor and is also lacking in the, these cancers. Um, so because of that, the drugs that I just talked about, transtuzumab, tamoxifen, et cetera, do not work in these cancers. Similar to the HER2 positive breast cancers, they're high grade, very aggressive cancers and that as I showed you, have a very high propensity for distant metastasis um, within five years following diagnosis. Although after five years, if they don't have a recurrence, they may well be cured from your cancer. They also um, have a propensity to develop brain metastasis. And unlike the HER2 positive brain metastasis, they're really very difficult to treat. So the reason they have such a poor outcome is, first of all, they're very aggressive. But secondly, the only treatment that we have in the early stage setting, well, I mean, the only approved treatment that we have in the early stage setting is chemotherapy. And the only treatment that we had in the metastatic setting um, until recently really was chemotherapy. And the problem is that about two thirds or certainly half of these triple negative breast cancers in harbor intrinsic resistance to chemotherapy. And we know this because very often the early stage setting would actually treat patients with triple negative breast cancer with preoperative chemotherapy. And um, only usually about half of those patients have a really good response to chemotherapy. So we know that the remainder of those cancers are likely somewhat resistant. On top of that, even the one, even the cancer, the triple negative cancers that are initially sensitive to chemotherapy uh, ultimately develop resistance. So it's really a huge problem. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a lack of therapeutic targets, um, unlike what I've shown you for the, the other subtypes of breast cancer. And that's really something that we're very focused on is to try and look for these therapeutic targets. Now, they also have a fairly interesting epidemiology. Um, and what we know, first of all, is that they tend to occur in younger women. Um, they also tend to, uh, they're associated with, with BRCA1 mutations. But they also uh, uh, occur more frequently in African-American women and also uh, uh, Latino women. Um, so this is some, some data that, uh, we, that we did when I was in Atlanta. This is looking at patients uh, under the age of 55 in, uh, in the Atlanta area. And what we're looking at here is the instance of triple negative breast cancers in the African-American patients compared to the Caucasian patients. And what you can find is in the younger patients under the age of 35, um, there's a very high rate of triple negative breast cancers in both groups, both the African-American and the white patients, as you can see shown here. However, what happens at the age of 35 is there's a pretty steep drop off in the instance of triple negative breast cancers in the white women, as you can see, but you just don't see this drop off in the African-American women. And if you look at all these different age groups, there's at least a 50% increased risk of triple or increased incidence of triple negative breast cancer in the African American women compared to the Caucasian women. And this was shown in a number of different uh, groups as well. Uh, it was first shown actually from the North Carolina group. Now, we don't know why this is. We don't know if it's just a genetic thing, an environmental thing, or a mixture. We just don't know at this time point. Um, you know, there was a study that came out from Africa that showed a very high rate of triple negative breast cancers in um, uh, in uh, north uh, northwestern Africa, um, where the rate was about seventy percent. However, there's been other series that have shown that the actual rate in Africa is similar to what we see here. So, again, at this point, we just don't know, and there's a lot of research interest in trying to determine this because it's clearly quite a significant disparity. Um, it's also been shown that African American women with triple negative breast cancer have, have a worse outcome when they're diagnosed with, with this subtype of breast cancer. Um, so, just going back to the, the the story again, just to remind you about Mary. So, again, she has metastatic triple negative breast cancer was diagnosed um, about uh, in, in 2011, received adjuvant chemotherapy, and then presented four years later with adenopathy in her neck and was found to have recurrent triple negative breast cancer. Um, now, as far as uh, the genetic testing, if you look, as I mentioned earlier, at the NCCN guidelines, they recommend testing um, any patient uh, uh, under the age of 60 with a triple negative breast cancer um, for or doing genetic testing for any patient under the age of 60 with triple negative breast cancer. And the reason for this, as I alluded to, is because there's an association between BRCA1 mutations and triple negative breast cancer. So Mary did have this done because although she's 72, because as I'm going to show you, there are treatments for patients who have BRCA mutations um, and triple negative breast cancer or metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we did test her. But her genetic analysis did not show any mutations in BRCA1 or any of the other genes uh, that, that appear to be associated with the, 
or any of the other, the other genes that may benefit from some of the therapies that we use in metastatic disease. Um, so Mary, of course, um, asked me, well, you know, what is her prognosis at this time point? And unfortunately, the 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 numbers are, are really quite scary looking at this. So, so this is a study that was done looking at a, a new agent called a PARP inhibitor, which I'll talk about in a second, along with standard chemotherapy in patients with newly diagnosed metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, so the patients got chemotherapy alone or, or with this novel PARP inhibitor. And unfortunately, the PARP inhibitor did not add at all, and, and I'll explain why that was in a second, um, to the chemotherapy. But the most striking thing here is how poorly these patients do. This is looking at overall survival. And you can see here that the median overall survival of these patients is 12 months or less. Um, and that's been shown in other studies as well. So you know, typically what I would have told her is that if she asked, I mean, I, we don't usually volunteer this information, but if she asked, I would probably have told her that the median survival was about a year, but you know, some patients do live longer. And so very dismal statistics. And I think they're not unlike what we would have seen with lung cancer before we had some of the new immunotherapy uh, regimens that we have right now. So let's turn to some more promising uh, um, information in, in, uh, with regards to triple negative breast cancers. So I mentioned PARP inhibitors early, uh, earlier. They are um, agents that basically target the DNA repair pathways um, in cancer cells. So there's a number of them approved, both in breast cancer and uh, in ovarian cancer. So essentially what the PARP inhibitors do is they basically result in a break, a single strand DNA break within the cancer cell. But what happens in a normal cancer cell is that the other DNA repair pathways, such as called homologous recombination, which include BRCA, um, actually repair the DNA. So basically the cancer cell does not die. However, if you use a PARP inhibitor in a patient who has a BRCA mutation, this homologous recombination is not present. So the DNA that's broken by the PARP inhibitor cannot be repaired and the cell dies. So it's really a perfect targeted therapy because it really only impacts the cancer cells and it doesn't impact really any, any, any normal tissue. And these drugs are generally pretty, pretty well tolerated. So basically the scenario is when the BRCA is function is absent and you basically inhibit PARP, you, the DNA cannot repair itself and the cancer cell dies. So these drugs uh, were initially approved in ovarian cancer, and then um, fairly recently we had an approval of two PARP inhibitors in metastatic breast cancer. So this is just one of the trials that looked at one of these drugs called telozoparib. Um, and what was done here was patients with metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer were randomized to receive either the PARP inhibitor or basically standard of care chemotherapy, which is the physician picked. And what you can see here is that the patients who got the PARP inhibitor um, had about a three month improvement in disease control shown here. These drugs are also better tolerated um, than the chemotherapy. So this led to their approval. Um, and just if you look at this trial, um, what they found was that in patients with triple negative breast cancer, which was about, um, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned all of these patients had BRCA mutations. Um, uh, so all these patients have BRCA mutations, half of them are triple negative breast cancer. And what you can see in this group of patients, clearly the patients who got the PARP inhibitor essentially did better. Um, so again, this would certainly be something that we would have used for Mary if she had a BRCA mutation. There's actually some very exciting data that came out this year actually showing that some of the other DNA repair mutations and some of the other DNA repair um, uh, enzymes such as PALB2 actually are also associated with benefit from these drugs. So that's gonna be able to increase the number of patients that are gonna benefit from these agents. Now, because they're so successful in patients who have BRCA mutations, there's been a lot of interest in trying to basically use these agents in patients who do not have BRCA mutations. And there is some data basically suggesting that these drugs can work with agents that target a different pathway in the cancer cell, which is called the PI3 kinase pathway. And Carrie Wazinski in our group is running this trial through the Big Ten Cancer Research Consortium, where she's taking patients who either have the majority of the patients <clears throat> that will be accrued just have non-BRCA related triple negative metastatic triple negative breast cancer and then there's a small small cohort who have germline BRCA mutations um, and they're basically being treated with a combination of the PARP inhibitor talisoparib and with a PI3 kinase inhibitor shown here 
Um, so this child study is recruiting well, and so far we've seen some activity. So the hope would be that you know the, the combination of the PARP inhibitor and the PI3 Chinese inhibitor might actually result in a new treatment for patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, the other, I would say, breakthrough we've had is with immunotherapy. I would say that in breast cancer, we're way behind a lot of the other solid tumors in using immunotherapies. We don't really have a lot of data. As single agents, there's been some activity, but really nothing too impressive. Um, I think the thing, and I think Tiziana gave grand rounds last year and probably talked about this. The thing with the immunotherapies is that they don't work in a lot of patients, but when they do work, they can work extremely well. Um, and, uh, and there's there's actually patients really living um, you know, much, much, much longer than they would have and when they respond to immunotherapies um, than, than, than before we had these agents. And of course, just to remind you, the, the whole idea behind these agents is that you basically activate the patient's immune system to kill the cancer cells. Um, so um, this is a, a study that was done in patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer who had not had prior treatment, and they were randomized to receive chemotherapy alone or with an immune therapy called a tezolizumab. And what they found looking at survival in the overall population is an improvement of about four months, as you can see shown here. Interesting, the control group here um, did better than what I'd shown you on the prior slide. You can see there was about um, almost a, an 18 month overall survival. It was improved to um, 20, 21 months with uh, the use of the immunotherapy. Um, actually, was not statistically significant, however. So, I mean, again, it was a benefit, but it, it's, it's, it's rather modest. However, what was found was that um, there's a, a protein called PDL1, and what was found was that if this protein is present in the immune cells surrounding a patient's cancer, there was a much more meaningful um, uh, uh, benefit on overall survival. So about 40% of patients in the study had these cancers that had the PDL1 expression in the immune cells. And in that group of patients, you can see the benefit of survival was much more meaningful. And this initial analysis was almost 10 months, so 16 months up to 25 months, so more than two years, as you can see shown here. Um, this overall survival benefit has decreased a little bit over time with longer follow-up, but it's still around seven months. Um, so, so clearly, there, there is a benefit for these agents. And, and the second agent, pembrolizumab, was just approved this week for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So again, as I say, um, they, when these drugs work, they work very well, but the problem is that they, they uh, really impact for the minority of patients with uh, triple negative breast cancer. So now I just want to end just basically talking about some of the research that we're doing here at UW. So the first thing just to mention is, as I showed you earlier, breast cancers themselves are pretty heterogeneous and there's different subtypes. Well, so in fact are triple negative breast cancers. So this was some very pivotal work that was done by the Vanderbilt group, um, where they basically did look at a set of genes in a group of triple negative breast cancers. And they found that there was at least six different subtypes of triple negative breast cancer shown here. Now, these have subsequently kind of been whittled down to four different subtypes, but they are all pretty different. There's two basal subtypes as an immune cell um, process subtype, which may be the ones that benefit from immune therapy. We don't know that at this time point. There's a, two that are mesenchymal, so they kind of look like sarcomas. And then there's this incredibly intriguing subtype, which is called the luminal angina receptor subtype. Um, and this subtype we were very fascinated about because it expresses angina receptor, which, as you probably know, is a protein that's typically expressed on protein. Oh, sorry, prostate cancer. So not only does it express angina receptor, but it also expresses all the downstream genes associated with angina receptor. And genomically, it actually looks like an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, but it is actually estrogen receptor negative. The reason it's luminal is because it expresses the angina receptor. So, of course, looking at this, we thought, well, this is great. Um, we'll just look at some prostate cancer drugs, and they should actually really help these uh, help patients with this type of triple negative breast cancer. Um, so there's been a couple of clinical trials done looking at this. Um, the, this particular study looked at the antiangin bicalutamide in 26 patients with metastatic angina receptor positive triple negative breast cancer. And they saw about a benefit in about 19% of patients with the median progression to pre survival and the disease control was only 12 weeks. That basically means the patient had disease progression by the time they had their first scan. Um, and um, this is just some data looking at a different antiangiogen, enzalutamide, in a preclinical model, basically showing that you can see that it nicely inhibits growth of these angiogen receptor triple negative uh, breast cancer cells. 
However, this drug was also looked at in a clinical trial. So again, this, these are patients with androgen receptor positive triple negative breast cancer. Um, again, unfortunately showing disease control only about 12 weeks, as you can see, a little bit higher if they had higher expression of the androgen receptor. So really kind of very dis disappointing results. So the question is, why is it that these AR positive triple negative breast cancers don't benefit from these prostate cancer treatments? Um, is it, are the resistance mechanisms similar to prostate cancer, which usually involve the androgen receptor localization or mutations or variants of the androgen receptor? Or could it be similar to estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, um, where it's actually expression of the androgen receptor and downstream proteins that are impacted? Or is it signaling through other pathways, which has been looked at by the Vanderbilt group? And if so, can we overcome the resistance by using some of the drugs that we've used very successfully in ER positive breast cancer? So I mentioned CDK inhibitors before uh, or previously, um, and there is some pretty compelling data to suggest that CDK inhibitors may be effective in these AR positive triple negative breast cancers. There was a study done where they looked at um, 18 cell lines, triple negative cell lines for sensitivity to the CDK inhibitor palbocyclob. And they found in these cell lines that it was the luminal androgen receptor subtype that benefited from the CDK inhibitor. And in actual fact, that benefit from the CDK inhibitor was associated, associated with androgen receptor expression. In prostate cancer shown here, this is a CDK inhibitor. Um, what you're seeing here, these are endolutamide resistant prostate cancers. You can see that the CDK inhibitor completely eradicates growth of these, uh, these uh, prostate cancer cells. And we also have shown in triple AR positive triple negative breast cancer cells that these uh, CDK inhibitors are very effective in inhibiting growth of these, of these AR positive triple negative cancers. Um, so uh, with Carrie, um, I'm leading this trial through Big, Big Ten, which is looking at a combination of a CDK inhibitor with the anti androgen bicalutamide in patients with AR positive metastatic uh, breast cancer, may have metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Patients get a lead of the bicalutamide and then receive bicalutamide plus, plus the CDK inhibitor. We're doing a lot of correlative studies, including doing a novel PET scan and also collecting blood for circulating tumor cells. Because one of our main goals of this study is to try and determine why it is that these androgen receptor triple negative breast cancers are resistant to anti androgens and anti androgen based therapy. And within the triple negative cell, uh, take, by taking off the, the circulating tumor cells, we're working with Josh Lang, who has a novel platform, I think as most of you know, to basically isolate circulating tumor cells out of the bloodstream. And what we're trying to do, and Marina Sharifi, one of our fellows is doing this work, is basically seeing if we can uh, mimic what Josh has done in prostate cancer with the circulating tumor cells as a means of determining why these cancers are resistant to antiandrogens. So this is Josh's work looking at prostate cancer, basically showing that if you take these circulating tumor cells, uh, these, these patients with prostate cancer, you can first of all quantify the androgen receptor, which is shown at the, the top part of this slide. Also look to see where the androgen receptor is localized in the cell. And then very importantly, look at all these different mutations of the androgen receptor shown down here. So what we're looking at here is as this patient develop resist, developed castrate resistance, you can see that the, the um, amount of androgen receptor in, in the cancer cells went up and they became, became lo localized within the nucleus. And then the, the patient uh, or the, 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 the cancer also developed all these mutations shown down here that have been shown to be resist, uh, associated with resistance to anti androgens And so far, Marina has done a lot of work on this, but this just basically shows that she is able to uh, isolate these circulating tumor cells from patients from the clinical trial I showed you and show that these circulating tumor cells do indeed express androgen receptor. And she's got a lot more work basically um, done with this and has been able to show that there are the presence of these androgen receptor variants within these circulating tumor cells. So hopefully this, this trial may provide, provide some basis that we can confirm um, the, the, some mechanisms of resistance to anti-androgens in these cancers. And um, we're also, um, prostate cancer specific membrane is highly expressed in prostate cancers. And there is a PET tracer um, that is used in, in men with prostate cancer, um, to, which is shown here. And what we know is that in prostate cancer, high PSMA expression associated with metastatic press spread and angin uh, independence. And most importantly, um, what's been shown by Steve Cho is that in men with prostate cancer, you can target PSMA um, with a, this, uh, <clears throat> this um, nucleotide, um, which has been shown to be successful in cast castrate-resistant prostate cancer. 
So as part of the clinical trial with Amy Fowler <clears throat> in radiology, we are going to do a PS PSMA PET in these patients. So our hypothesis is that since these cancers are antigen receptor positive, they may also express PSMA. So we're going to look at that. And there is some data showing that a PSMA expression in breast cancer does correlate with estrogen receptor negativity and has been shown in triple negative breast cancers. So if, if we find that these AR positive triple negative breast cancers do express PSMA, the plan would be then to use the, the radionucleotide that's been used in prostate cancer to treat these AR positive triple negative breast cancers. Um, so the other thing, couple of things that we're doing is um, what we know is that a number of triple negative, about 50% of triple negative breast cancers express, express a protein called an epidermal growth factor receptor. You can see this one and uh, this one down here. Um, and this is a, a protein that's been very successfully targeted in lung cancer. And um, Carrie Wazinski and uh, Derek Wheeler have been working on a project uh, looking at EGFR. And what they found basically was that in about 20% of triple negative breast cancers, EGFR is abnormally located in the, the nucleus. Now, since a lot of the agents that we use to target EGFR are antibodies, um, you're not going to be able to target uh, the EGFR if it's present in the nucleus. But what Derek actually found was that by using the satinib, which is a drug we use in leukemia, you can actually mobilize EGFR back onto the cell surface. And by that way, you can actually resensitize these triple negative breast cancers to these anti-EGFR antibodies. So this is shown here. So in other words, you basically have the EGFR in the nucleus. You then use the satinib to displace it up to the cell surface. And then you can use a drug like cetuximab, which is an antibody against EGFR to treat these cancers. So um, Carrie and, and Derek have an R01 right now that includes a window study where we're taking patients with um, early stage triple negative breast cancer that have EGFR in the nucleus. They get a couple of weeks of desatinib and then they go to surgery or, or, or have a biopsy to see if the EGFR has relocalized onto the cell surface. But the ultimate goal of this would be to actually use this in patients with metastatic disease where they would receive the satinib initially and then get treated with an EGFR inhibitor. And I think the way we would, we would see if the EGFR is localized is by essentially using Josh's CTC platform to try and determine where the EGFR is localized in the cells. And then lastly, um, some work that to do with Vince Crimes. Um, so uh, trail or death receptors are very important in cancer because when they're active, they result in apoptosis, which is essentially the, uh, leads to, to cancer cell death. Um, and um, there's been a lot of interest in targeting trail receptors in metastatic breast cancer. Um, however, to date, much of the data that we have has been very disappointing. So um, there's been a number of trail agonist antibodies that have been used either alone or with chemotherapy and really haven't shown very uh, promising results. So the question is, um, since death receptors are a way of killing cancer cells, how could we increase the efficacy of the agents we have available or could we find new agents that might be effective? And what, um, what's been shown is that methionine, which is an essential amino acid, um, has been, been shown to be, if, if you basically take triple negative breast cancer cells and basically starve them of methionine, they actually die. Um, and it's unclear um, how this happens. And um, well, Vince was able to show that if you restrict methionine in triple negative breast cancer cell lines, what basically happens is you actually upregulate trail and death receptors, which is shown here. Um, so these, this is, these are cancer, triple negative cancer cells that are, are starved of methionine versus control. And you can see this marked increase in, these, uh, in the expression of these trail res receptor to death receptors shown here. Um, so based on this, we have a, a window study open, which is, again, for patients with optimal triple negative breast cancer, where they take a methionine restricted diet, which I'll explain in a second, and then they go to surgery or have a biopsy, and we're looking to see if there's an increase in the expression of trail receptors in the biopsy after the methionine restricted diet compared to um, um, before they start the diet. Um, however, uh, Vince was also showed that by restricting triple, triple negative breast cancer cells from methionine, um, you actually were able to, uh, you actually sensitize them to the trail receptor agonists that are currently available. So again, what we're looking at here is triple negative cell lines. Um, they're treated with this trail receptor agonist alone or with the methionine restricted diet. And you can see where the little asterisks are. When you give the diet along with the trail agonist, you pretty much wipe out um, the growth of these cancer cells. Um, and this is just basically showing the same thing in an animal model, showing that if you take the diet with trail agonists, you can you really inhibit growth of these triple negative uh, uh, um, 
cells compared to the control as you can see in both of these, these mouse models. And within the mouse models, there's also a marked decrease in the rate of lung metastasis shown here. So again, here is the trail agonist, the diet, and the combination together. And you can see there's a marked reduction in both the surface area of the metastasis and the number of, of metastasis when you give the diet together. So through funding from the Wisconsin Partnership Program and the V Foundation, um, we, Vince and I are, are running this trial, um, which is for patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer, um, where they get randomized to a novel um, trail agonist on 201 alone, or with a diet that is restricted from methionine. Um, and this methionine uh, free diet um, basically is, is free, uh, sorry, it, it includes fruits, grains, and vegetables. Um, it, it also involves a, a, a shake that they have to take daily to keep, keep their calories up. And the plan is for them <clears throat> to take the diet for part of the week, uh, not the entire week, because it's, it's rather restrictive diet. So as I always say, uh, when I talk about the diet for people in Wisconsin, the bad news is you can't have any cheese. However, you can have beer. So that's at least one way of sending it to patients. Um, but just like we did before, we are collecting blood um, on this trial for circulating tumor cells, again, to look at trail levels and see if the, the diet actually increases the expression of trail on the circulating uh, tumor cells. Um, so just to go back to Mary really quickly, just I want to end on a high note. So Mary um, did not have a BRCA mutation, so she wasn't a candidate for a PARP inhibitor. She actually had, her cancer did express androgen receptor, so she did go on our androgen receptor study um, with the bicalutamide and ribocyclob. She stable disease about, for about six months, but then developed disease progression, and then put her on chemotherapy, and her chemo, her, her cancer is completely chemo-resistant. She had disease progression of three months, as you can see. She then enrolled on another clinical trial with the chemotherapeutic and immunotherapy, and that was back in January of 2018. Six months later, she had complete response in her scans. In a year later or so, she developed immune nephritis and had to come off the immune therapy, has remained on the chemotherapy. But to this date, which we're coming up on two years, she now had, currently has no evidence of disease. And we actually recently stopped her chemotherapy, and I'm pretty hopeful that she'll remain with no evidence of disease for um, a prolonged period of time. So at least uh, ending on a high note with this. So in conclusion, I think targeting hormone and HER2 receptors has been a real um, success in breast cancer overall, though we have a lot, a lot of work still to do. Genomic typing has allowed us to identify new targets across all cancers, but resistance to therapy remains a huge issue. And I think I hopefully I've shown you the triple negative breast cancer is a significant unmet need. So I think we're getting towards our goal of perfect targets in breast cancer, but we're still not there, unfortunately. So I'd like to thank um, all the breast team here, shown here. Um, also, uh, Marina, who's doing the work with the CTCs with Josh, and um, Siswali in my lab, and Vince, uh, Amy Fowler, um, and all the, the breast dots shown here in the CTD2 dot as well. Um, I also want to thank all the wonderful faculty that I've been able to work with for the last six years and the really outstanding leadership team shown here that I have had the, had the opportunity to work with. And in particular, I'd like to just thank Julene, who was my right hand throughout all of this. She's just, just a fantastic administrator. And also Howard for all his mentorship and support for the time I've been here. And I know I'll be reaching out to him going forward as well, as I will to Dr. Shah. So thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much for a wonderful overview, starting from the cows and moving to the genetic era. It's actually a pretty impressive story um, with, uh, I would say, rapid acceleration over the past 10 to 20 years. Um, uh, there's a question from Laura, uh, Lauren Banachek. Uh, are PARP inhibitors associated with secondary malignancies such as AML, uh, and MDS in the long term since homologous recombination and DNA repair is being in inhibited? What a great question. The answer is yes. There, there actually is a very low rate of MDS and, and acute leukemia that has been that we have to obviously tell patients about. Again, it's always a risk benefit thing, but there, there certainly is um, a, a risk of that for sure. So, great question. Um, and so, my question is in terms of the goal for it being a chronic disease. Is the um, do you see the model being you're going to need to continue to take your immune modulators or chemotherapy forever, or is it you take it for a year, two years, go off, see what happens? Um, what which way do you think the field will go? 
Yeah, great question. Well. So first of all, chemotherapy, we're not going to achieve chronic disease state with chemotherapy. We've, we've been there, we've had it for so long. And actually, you know, people have looked at you know, drug holidays from chemotherapy and this kind of conflicting data. With the immune therapy, I just don't think we know. I mean, I think there are patients that, you know, really do great with immune therapy. I have another patient, for example, that actually has she was actually on the same trial as the case that I was talking about, but she came off the immune therapy, I think, probably more than two years ago. And during that time, all we've done, done is given her a tiny bit of radiation to her breast, nothing else. She's had no other systemic therapy and she's still completely free of disease. So I think we don't know. Um, and it, it really is an important question because obviously these drugs have some toxicity and they're also very costly as well. The, the HER2 setting is very interesting because there are a lot of cases of patients with HER2 positive metastatic disease that basically remain on either just trastuzumab or trastuzumab with one of the other antibodies indefinitely. And they're living like, you know, 10 years, even longer than that. And you get to a point where you're like going, do you really have to bring them in all the time to get these treatments? And we just don't know, although anecdotally, you know, people would say that when you stop the treatment, the cancer becomes more active. So I would say at this time point, when we talk about a chronic disease, it really means they're going to be on treatment pretty much indefinitely. Part of it is I think we're kind of chicken to stop the drugs as well, um, because you never know if you if you stop and then we challenge them, they're going to work as well. Um, but so I, we always say to patients, it's kind of like being a diabetic, but it really isn't because you know, in some ways it is because you're always going to be on treatment, but, you know, you're also coming in for scans all the time. And, you know, we do try to, you know, increase the frequency between scans if they do continue to have stable disease, but it's a kind of different scenario. So the simple answer is, I think we, they will remain on treatment, but we really don't know at this time point. Great. Okay. Well, we are out of time. Um, I want to thank Dr. O'Regan again for a wonderful overview of some very exciting work um, that's currently being done. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having her come back and uh, share the results of some of the clinical trials that she's actively uh, engaged with. So thank you everyone for your attention uh, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.